good morning year 10. I hope you are all keeping well and you are enjoying a slightly more sedated and quiet version of life. Don't go going stir crazy, there's plenty of English work for you to do and there's plenty of thrilling books you could be reading and there's also quite a good few programmes on Netflix. So keep going up that exercise, keep yourself busy and try not to miss me too much guys. Okay, so this is our second tutorial. Uh, this is going to be the little uh, assessment um, that you're going to be doing for this term. Don't get yourselves too stressed by this. I know you're going to find it harder and more of a challenge to do it without having a teacher there to kind of ask questions to. So I'm not going to be grading you exactly in the same way. I am going to use the mark scheme from the GCSE exactly the way we have done all the way through year 10 so that we can get a sense of where we're sitting on it. But it's not going to go on your go for schools as your next grade. OK, so don't get yourself panicked if you think you're not going to do as well as normal. OK, one, this tutorial is going to take you through and prep you and let you know exactly what you need to produce in it. So that will help you Two, You can always email me if you've got questions or you're stuck on anything. And three, we've already practiced. Uh, little tasks like this throughout the term already. So it's not something that you should struggle with too bad. So um, I want you to open your classwork books. I want you to write down the title in the middle of the screen, English language, paper two, question five, assessment. As you all know, you're going to underline that with a ruler. Then I want you to write down the LO at the bottom of the screen, which is to plan and write convincingly for a specific genre audience and purpose. The assessment is due, oh sorry, I've got the 20th up there, but I've changed the date. It's actually Wednesday the 22nd. Okay, you can submit it earlier if you want to, that isn't gonna be an issue. Um, obviously, there's only a couple of days left before the Easter holiday, so I'm giving you um, a, few, a couple of days when we get back as well to have time to get it done. If you are bored and you're going so crazy and you want to do it over the Easter holiday, that is fine, it's not a problem, but I'm not going to expect you to complete it in those two weeks where you could be having some free time with your family. So it's up to you. Uh, at the moment, the only way to submit it is to email it to me. Um, however, after Easter, you should all be getting set up on what's called Microsoft Teams. I will, um, there's, there's a little note about that at the end of, um, this PowerPoint slide so I'll clarify that with you um, at that point I don't know exactly how you'll be set up on it because that's ICT and we all know how useless I am with that uh, but I have worked Microsoft Teams and it, it's weird at the beginning but then you can get used to it quite quickly so you're far more technologically advanced than I am so I'm sure you'll be fine with it okay we're going to go on to the next slide now so Paper two, question five. Your local newspaper printed the following statement from a reader. The corona, sorry, yeah, the coronavirus should be taken seriously. It costs lives. Schools should be shut, festivals banned, and sporting events postponed. Your task is to write a letter to your local newspaper arguing whether this should happen or why you think this should not happen. So you're basically arguing for or against the statement, but you need to argue it in terms of your opinion and your reasons why. That's why I slightly reworded it rather than just saying for or against. I don't want you only addressing the statement, okay? Because remember, you're writing to an editor about a statement that's been put in their paper. They didn't write the statement necessarily, but they are the people in charge of the editor. Um, sorry, let me try that again. They're the person in charge of the paper that it was published in. Okay, so 24 marks will be for the content and the organisation. So that's your ideas, your arguments, how you've laid that out. And then 16 marks for the technical accuracy, i.e. how sophisticated is your, is your vocabulary? What range of punctuation have you used? How accurate is that punctuation? How accurate is your spelling? How sophisticated and varied um, are, is your vocabulary okay 
Content will also include your persuasive devices for that 24 marks because obviously you're arguing to persuade the editor of your opinion. Why are you correct? So therefore you have to be using those persuasive devices. We have talked about those already. We have used those already, but I will be reiterating them in a couple of slides time. So features of a letter. Your task, as I've said, is to write a letter to your local editor. So a couple of the basics. At the top over here on the right hand side, you need to put your address. Do not worry, this does not have to be your real address. If you want to make up an address so you're not telling me where you live, that is perfectly fine. But even if you do use your address, I promise you I'm not coming around to visit. OK, and then underneath, I want you to put the date. Now, that has to be the long date, the date in full. OK, just put the date of when you write the assessment. It doesn't really matter what the date is, but you need to be in that habit of putting the full date in when you write a letter. Because a letter is one of the things that often comes up uh, in the GCSE exam. OK, as I've told you before, the three most common are letter, speech and newspaper article. OK. Now, over here on the left hand side, you need the address of the recipient. That means the person you're sending it to. Now, obviously, what we've said is you're sending this to your local newspaper. So you may want to use a name of a local newspaper you know of. You may want to use that um, an address in Haverhill. OK, but if you don't, you can either make up your own address or use the made up address in this example. I will not mark you down for using the address in this example, okay? Now, that address needs to come on just one line below where you have the date, okay? So right at the top of the page on the right hand side, your address, the next line, the date, one line below on the opposite side of the page is the address of the recipient. Then you leave uh, a line again, and you always start uh, your letter with dear. Now, if you know the name of the person you are writing to, it's dear Mr. or it's dear Mrs. If you don't know, and in this case, we just have the editor, so you may well not know, you can, for this task, make up the name. You won't be marked down for that. But on the grounds that you haven't been given the name, you can just write dear sir or madam. OK. Then you include a comma. OK, it is important that you use your commas correctly and in your writing, do not keep putting and, 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 and use commas. Break your writing up using punctuation. So you're going to use the comma here, then you're going to go up to the next line and you're going to indent in. OK, so you're either going to tab or space bar across if you're typing this up. And then uh, a very good way of opening this would be I am writing to you because, OK? Because you have to give an introduction. You have to tell the person reading your letter what your purpose is so that straight away they know what they're dealing with. That first paragraph should be quite short, quite succinct, just laying out the reasons, the initial purpose, the aims of which you are writing this for. So you are going to need, in the body of your argument, of your ideas, of your letter, you are going to need to use those persuasive features. As I already mentioned, here is a recap. So we have alliteration, the bouncing ball. OK, we all know alliteration. You identify it really, really well when we see it, when we're practicing our literature and you can all use it. OK, an anecdote. Now, we started to practice this, if you remember. We looked at that, um, that article about um, whether, you know, being strict with children and things. And we looked at that, a woman who had a little two year old in the basket um, undressed in a freezing cold winter and why it was so ludicrous just because her two year old girl said that she didn't want to get dressed. Um, that's an anecdote. OK, these are harder. So your anecdote, you'll have to really think about it because your anecdote has to be a short story that is a clear example of why something is so wrong or so ridiculous. OK. So you might have an example about somebody that didn't socially distance and then the amount of people that they spread it to or how quickly they got it and they made somebody who was vulnerable in their family or who ended up in hospital. It could be anything like that. 
Repetition. Repeat a key phrase or a key word. Repetition is really, really important because one, it's actually a really simple technique to use and build in. Two, it's very effective because it keeps the reader being um, focused on what your key ideas are, on what your key points are, on what your key argument is. If you notice, I don't know if you're watching the daily um, updates and things on BBC, but the politicians, when they're talking, they do it a lot. They repeat the same phrase. They repeat the same word. It keeps us on point. It um, reinforces those ideas. Rhetorical questions. These are a very effective way of opening or closing a paragraph. It makes the reader think about and engage with the topic. It makes them take a personal stance on it. Okay. Um, tricolons, triplets, power of three. These, I don't know why, but for some reason there's three different terms that are regularly used for these. They all just mean the same thing. It's that using an element um, in a three. So, for example, in Churchill's key speech, we'll fight them in the air, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the sea. That idea, we'll fight them, we'll fight them, we'll fight them. It was only the end location that changed. That's that trick, that, that's that power of three. You've got, it's almost a complete repetition, but there's something just slight variant in those three different points that you make. Okay? Imperatives, commands, we must, we have to, stop this, change this. Okay? You're trying to be persuasive, you're trying to convince this person this is important. You have to show your passion, you have to show how important you're taking it. Using imperatives, using commands will help with that. Facts and statistics. They support your argument. They add weight to it. They make it seem like it's not just you rambling, but it's you having clear, concise reasons. Now, you have a bit of extra freedom with this because you're doing it at home. So feel free to Google and pull up some facts and statistics to quote some of the uh, uh, people that have been doing the daily uh, broadcasts on the news. Um, in the real thing, in the exam, you won't be able to do that. And don't worry, you can make up your facts and statistics. But while you've got them to hand, use them. Use what you can find on the internet. I mean, it's locked on this topic at the moment. Hyperbole, exaggeration, be dramatic, be over the top, okay? It exacerbates your point. It, um, reinforces it, it brings the drama to your argument. Emotive language. We want to make uh, people feel either sad about what they're doing, angry about what people are doing, or shocked. Okay, they're the three key ones. If you can make them feel sad for someone or something, it will make an impression. If you can make them feel angry about something, it makes an impression. And if you can make them shocked and horrified by something, again, it makes a strong impression. Inclusive pronouns, us, our, we, okay? Build them in, assume that they're on the same side as you are. Assume that they can see how logical your argument is. Okay, you can note these down with the little um, added information I've given, but you don't have to, okay? But if you want to note these down, please feel free to. Now, how should I present my ideas? As I said already, you have to start with an introduction, okay? Your introduction is going to be very brief. Now, each of these slides has an example. You can read this example. You can steal some ideas. You can look at the kind of language that's being used. There's clear examples of uh, accurate use of punctuation. Use that to help and guide you. I'm not going to bother reading these through to you. You can all read these. However, I do want to lay this point very clearly. If I get anybody's work in and all they've done is just retype the example, changing three or four words, it is going to be sent straight back to you and you are going to be told to do it again. Okay? These example paragraphs are not for you to just copy because that isn't going to help you. Okay? I want to see how well you can do this. How much have you taken on board of what you've been practicing in class so far? How well can you present an argument? How well can you use these uh, persuasive devices? There's no point saying how well you can copy from a PowerPoint because you're not going to be able to do that in the exam and that isn't going to get you any marks. Okay? 
So use these for some ideas, use these examples to show you how to structure. Do not just copy. I hope I've made that very clear. So if you want to pause while you read that paragraph, paragraph, sorry, please feel free. As I said, I'm not going to read it out. I'm going to go on to the next slide. So main paragraph, okay? First argument, look at the statement, okay? So we've addressed cost lives in our introduction. Now schools. So if schools is the first part of the statement, deal with that in your first paragraph, okay? So first argument is about schools needing to be shut and why they need to be shut. What are the dangers of keeping them open? They're open. What are the benefits of closing them? You can, my greens and my purples, if you want to challenge and make this more um, developed and more persuasive, you can address some of the problems with closing schools, but then present the argument of why these problems aren't as important and aren't as serious and aren't as dangerous as coronavirus. Okay? Because being able to address the opposing argument and prove it as wrong really helps you develop that argument, that sophistication, and that um, it'll just move you up the bands on the mark scheme. Okay, paragraph two. Okay, we've looked at school, so now let's look at the next thing in that statement festivals and sporting events. Okay. So we're going to combine these together. What are the problems? What are the dangers? Why should they be uh, uh, sorry, banned or postponed? How can we move them? The positives of having these things to look forward to once everything's over and done with. How unimportant they are compared to people's lives and safety and compared to you know, making sure our hospitals don't get too full. Things like that. Again, as I've said before, I'm not going to read out the example paragraph, but please feel free to pause it here and read that paragraph if you want to. And then third paragraph, lockdown. Okay, What do you think a lockdown should be? Why is it important? Why do people need to adhere to this? If people aren't, eat, despite the fact that we're in lockdown, if people still aren't socially isolating or shielding or distancing, what should be done? What do you think we should do uh, about the groups of people that are ignoring or flouting this lockdown? Okay, why is the lockdown important? Who does it help? Who are we endangering when we ignore it? And what should be done for those people or to those people who won't abide by it? And then conclusion, okay? This is your final attempt to argue your viewpoint and persuade your audience to agree with you, okay? Here, we really want that, rom uh, that romantic, we don't want romantic language, we want that emotive language, okay? You want this conclusion to summarise your key points, repeat, reiterate those key ideas, those big dangers of not following this. I'm assuming you're going to argue for the statement. It, obviously, if you're arguing against the statement, it would be the big issues of why we need to keep these things running, what the danger is to the economy, how difficult it is for parents with schools closed, those kind of things. You can argue the other way, just with the amount of evidence and everything that's going on, it would probably be easier to argue for the statement. Okay, but this is the point where you summarise you reiterate, you repeat those key ideas, you use really dramatic, emotive language, and it really works here to end on either a dramatic hyperbole or a really emotive and evocative um, rhetorical question. Okay? And then, key thing, it's really easy to do, it doesn't take a lot of work, but remembering how to sign off a letter really helps you with that um, 24 marks. That content and organisation, one of the things it's saying, are you writing for the purpose? The purpose is a letter. So completely structuring that letter from beginning to end the way it should be means you're ticking that box up really clearly. Okay? So, once you finish a letter, um, what have I written here? If you know them and have used their name at the beginning, sign off by saying yours sincerely and then your name, as the example below states. If you don't know them and you opened it with sir or madam, okay, 
or to whom it may concern is another way you could open the letter. Signing it off by saying yours faithfully and then your name. Okay, so sincerely with the name, faithfully without the name. Okay, for a letter to an editor, it's conventional to put your location at the bottom too. In all honesty, in the exam, if you don't put that, that isn't going to lose you any marks, but it doesn't hurt for you to practice and get used to that for real life when you're writing. So yours sincerely, do your little squiggly signature and then write your title, so miss or mister, I'm assuming none of you are married, uh, and then your surname. And if you want, include that location as well. Okay, as I said, if you've got any questions, email me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Don't forget, you can rewind and pause this to help you as you go through, okay? Go back, reread those examples to help you get some ideas, but do not copy, okay? You have until, oh, no, sorry. I've missed a whole slide. I forgot about this slide. This is just giving you a rough layout of how your letter needs to look at the end. Address, date, recipient's address, dear, intro, main paragraph, main paragraph, main paragraph, conclusion, sign off. Okay, I've made this really nice and small so you can't just read it as a whole letter and copy it. Quick recap. Begin with your address in the top right corner of the page. Immediately below this, include the date. Uh, begin with the intro into the letter. Okay, most formal is it will start with dear. Remember to add the comma after the name. Start a new paragraph and clearly state the reason you're writing. Main body of your letter. Aim to include three main paragraphs. This should include schools, festivals, lockdown. Then conclusion and ending, i.e. signing off your letter. Sum up your argument. You know the name of the person, sign off saying yours sincerely, followed by your name on the next, not on the, not on the next paragraph, sorry, on the next section. Okay, so here is the band two and band three of the AO5 content on the mark scheme. So this shows you what I will be looking at when I'm marking this. As I said at the beginning, this is due for Wednesday the 22nd of April. Please email it to my email address. I'm sure you all already have this. On the next slide, I'm going to take you on to that in just a second. That's the mark scheme for the band four. Okay, so I've put these two on there so that you can see. If you don't think you can make it to the band four, aim for the top of this level three. But make sure, start from the bottom of level two. Make sure as you're doing it. You're going back and checking that you are ticking these skills off, okay? Think about the difference between some, that means you're doing it a little bit, you're occasionally doing it, and usually, okay? Usually means it's consistent, it's regular, okay? Uh, here, on the right-hand side, uh, is, the AO, is the AO5 band 4, exactly the same as what we were looking at with the band 2 and band 3, but showing the difference, how convincing, compelling, sophisticated, ambitious, sustained everything needs to be to be in that band 4. And then we've also got the skills descriptors for the top of the AO6. Remember, the AO6 is for that spelling, punctuation, grammar, um, vocabulary. Okay. Uh, I think that is everything you will need. So I hope that's been helpful. I hope you all know what you need to be doing. If you need to write it in your books and take a photo of it and send that to me, that's fine. It is much harder to mark that way. So wherever possible, if you can type it, that would be brilliant. As I said, Microsoft Teams is going to be started up um, towards the end of the Easter holidays. So if you're doing it in the first couple of days back, you should be on Microsoft Teams by then, I think. So you'll be able to upload it to your Microsoft Teams. However, if you want to complete it tomorrow or Friday, or you do uh, find yourself on a bit of a bit of a loose end and you need to, something to keep you out of mischief, feel free to do it over the Easter holidays and send it to me. That isn't a problem. Okay. Have a lovely rest of your day. And like I said before, email me if you have any questions. Thanks. Bye, everyone.